everyone welcome to reason with science i'm your host jitendra this episode is with william martin he is the head of the institute of molecular evolution at the university of dusseldorf with a career spanning over decades he has made significant contributions to the field of molecular biology particularly in the areas of evolution and symbiosis here we talk about the question of origin of life importance of metabolism prebiotic chemistry at the hydrothermal vents emergence of information compartmentalization and early evolution of cells enjoy the conversation share and subscribe to support the podcast thank you for listening hi bill welcome to the podcast uh, it's my pleasure to tender so starting with charles darwin who uh, conceived not only the idea of uh, evolution by natural selection but also something called warm little pond uh, in which uh, a primitive life forms may arise so how do you think about um, you know in in 21st century how do you think about the question of origin of life every culture on earth has a story for how everything began uh this is true for uh the, the different human cultures with their different languages there's always an origins narrative and the question is it's not obvious why we have to have that all these origins narratives are different yeah uh, and that means that they arose independently uh different human cultures story for how everything began are different it's not clear to me why we need to know that it's clear that we there is a need for humans to uh I have an answer as to where things come from uh life but it's not obvious why that is the case and in, in darwin's case he was just taking the the evolutionary idea all the way back to the beginning right and saying and he had this imagination of a warm little pond something aqueous uh full of proteins um we had darwin had no clue as to what cells are actually composed of and so he could kind of imagine it that was a letter to hooker if i uh, properly uh, remember um so what darwin did is he did the same thing as the biblical story of origins did or the um uh, Amer- or the, the the maya story of origins or the um uh, egyptian story of origins or the <clears throat> greek story of origins started in a place <clears throat> there's a setting <clears throat> excuse me there's a setting an environment that somehow um exerts an influence on how everything began okay so for the the whether it's the garden of eden or or uh the origin of humans from from uh corn or uh the uh, nordic mythology there's always some place where these uh, where these events took place and the the environment where they took place exerts an influence on the process itself so the warm little pond is stuck right this is this has been a, a a very familiar sort of a setting we can imagine something warm and cuddly uh organic soup i think was the the term that uh, uh, that uh, haldane used to describe the contents of uh, such a pond and th- that that idea has stuck for a long time but that has to do with um, what's interesting is that this origin story for uh, at darwin's time arose before we knew anything about how microbes actually live uh, how the life process actually functions as a chemical process and so it remained a just a uh, now a narrative a story something that we could imagine that in no way connected to the chemistry of cells because the chemistry of cells was completely unknown but now we know a lot about it so uh, what do you think that are, are we able to replace warm little pond with something or we are still stuck with the same narrative and we are continuing in the same directions uh, it depends on who you who you talk to i'm sure you've interviewed people from the 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 rna world community and they're still very much uh dead set on surface environments uv light uh promoting a particular kind of chemistry that works very well in the laboratory and because they can get that chemistry to work in the laboratory to make rna bases they say that uh this is the uh, the chemistry from which uh, the the first life processes arose of course 
RNA in metabolism does not rise from does not arise from UV light or cyanide components. Uh, it arises from amino acids and from C1 compounds uh, out of C1 metabolism. And uh, so the, the question is, <clears throat> are there environments today that are uh, have more similarity to the uh, chemistry of microbial cells? And that's also a question of what kind of microbial cells uh, would we want to, would be the most ancient that where we could make a connection between the chemistry of earth and the chemistry of life. And it turns out that even before, <clears throat> well, as it was after Darwin, but before uh, Oprin and Haldane came up with their warm little pond theory or their, their um, it was a, that was not a warm, it was the uh, organic soup theory in a warm little pond. Uh, there, there, there was a, a theory among biologists uh, and microbiologists in particular that life arose from carbon dioxide through uh, autotrophic processes using uh, chemical energy without the help of chlorophyll and anaerobic. I can give you those citations from a, uh, a Russian biochemist by the name of Konstantin Mariskovsky. That was 1910. And he inferred that just by looking at comparative biochemistry and the ideas that we had then about the early earth. And so if we say arose from CO2 without the help of chlorophyll using chemical energy and anaerobic, that would be today anaerobic chemolithoautotrophs. And it's very interesting if you look around uh, CO2 fixation. There are only two ways. It's amazing, actually. There are only two ways to fix CO2. There are only two ways that life uses to fix CO2. There is sunlight and there is molecular hydrogen, H2. That's it. That's it. Everything else is derived from one of those two, okay? From one of those two processes. So that means that in terms of primary production, that is a sustained source of CO2 fixation independent of oxygen <clears throat> uh, on this planet, there are only those two processes. And because photosynthesis is derived from respiration and respiration is derived from fermentations and fermentations are derived from autotrophy, uh, that puts H2, hydrogen, and CO2 as the starting point of metabolism. Okay, so that idea is fairly old, but it's much older than um, much older than our knowledge about how cells live. I think that the, the time of genomics will also go down as the time in history where biologists understood how cells work. Okay, so in the 1950s, uh, there was uh, understanding about uh, how high energy bonds are made. Uh, there was uh, Calvin's work on the Calvin cycle, the first CO2 fixation pathway. Um, leave DNA out of it. That was important, but that's not, that's how cells remember who they are. Uh, it's not how they make a living. Uh, then there was the big question during the late 50s and the early 60s of how cells actually make ATP. There was Peter Mitchell's chemiosmotic hypothesis. Um, Substrate level phosphorylation, the, the simpler form, there, there are two ways to make ATP. There's substrate level phosphorylation and there's chemiosmotic harnessing at the, using a, an ATP synthase at a membrane. And uh, those basic processes of how cells fix carbon, fix nitrogen, use energy to run the life process, those only became fully apparent in full detail <clears throat> during the 1990s and the early 2000s. Okay, so that people could really make a balanced stoichiometric map of what is going on in a cell, describing a cell as a chemical reaction, okay, a balanced stoichiometric chemical reaction where all the, all the parts are in place. Um, part of that, that was particularly difficult for anaerobes uh, that, you, that live from H2 and CO2. These would be uh, in the bacteria, a group called the acetogens, and in the archaea, a group called the uh, methanogens. That was particularly difficult because only in 2008 was a very crucial process discovered. It's the only new mechanism of energy conservation discovered <clears throat> since 1961, and it's called electron bifurcation. And um, 
uh, that uh, uh, electron, uh, the flavin-based electron bifurcation is a soluble process of splitting electrons from hydrogen. And it explains how cells can use electrons from hydrogen to fix CO2, fix CO2 even though the midpoint potential of hydrogen is not sufficient to do so under normal conditions within a cell, okay? Now we'll get to some experimental data in our own group that uh, uh, shows that H2 and CO2 can react to the basic compounds of, of biochemistry without electron bifurcation, but there's a trick to that that we need to know, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, so the, the discovery of electron-based uh, electron uh, flavin-based electron bifurcation allowed scientists to to draw balanced maps of carbon and energy metabolism in cells that live from the reduction of CO2 uh, with electrons from hydrogen. That's the most primitive form of metabolism. These uh, acetogens and methanogens. That's work many groups worldwide. For the methanogens are to mention Ralph Wolf, um, Ruth Rolf Tower, uh, Georg Fuchs. There are a lot of people to mention. Oh Lord, Metcalf. Uh, start if I start mentioning names, I'll just I'll forget a lot. There are a lot of people involved in that, and then there are also the acetogens that would be worked by um, uh, Fulker Muller and uh, Steve Ragsdale. In particular, those how these how these cells uh, perform their biochemical reactions. So, the hydrothermal vents, interestingly, the ones that I think are interesting, the serpentinizing hydrothermal vents, they generate molecular hydrogen in a spontaneous chemical reaction where water reacts with rocks in the crust. They generate hydrogen day in, day out, 24 seven, and they have for 4 billion years, 4.2 billion years since there's been water on earth. This molecular hydrogen is the fuel for cells today. It was the fuel for all cells, for all biotopes, for all forms of life before the origin of photosynthesis, okay? It's really important and it's really primitive. And what's really interesting is that if you look at the enzymes that are involved in that metabolism today, they're chock full of metals, transition metals as their main catalysts. The main players are iron, nickel, molybdenum, tungsten, and cobalt. Okay, so the hydrothermal vents um, actually reduce CO2 themselves to methane, and they reduce it to formate, which is the first intermediate in the methane or acetate forming pathways of acetogens and methanogens. They basically recapitulate <clears throat> the core biochemical pathways of the most primitive organisms on earth just using inorganic catalysts. And so <clears throat> my proposal is that, and it is my proposal, it's not somebody else's proposal, is that this, this chemistry uh, at hydrothermal vents uh, generating acetate and methane is the energy releasing reaction from which the first metabolic processes arose, and it is also the energy releasing reaction of the first cells on earth. So the replacement of uh, a warm little pond is this hydrothermal vent, a specific type of hydrothermal vent, which of course we'll talk uh, more about that. Um, and uh, one striking uh, thing here that I notice is that in, in, in the conception or what Darwin conceived as warm, warm little pond, he was actually thinking of energy as well. And in your case, when you're thinking of hydrothermal vents, you are also looking at the energy, which will um, enable the formation of different compounds. Now, well, energy is crucial. What did, uh, I don't recall exactly what uh, he said, uh, inorganic salts, phosphate, but I don't recall, uh, Darwin didn't mention UV light. What energy, what energy source did he mention in that little message, in that little if, passage to Hooker? If I'm not correct, it was the sunlight, but... Um, um, okay, um, that would be sunlight. Okay, so so you can, you can uh, it, we'll give him credit for that. We'll say sunlight or uh, uh, radiation. Now, that, if you, if you have that, then you have to have some compounds that can absorb that radiation, and you also have, then you already have a problem with uh, transduction. Now, it was known 
<clears throat> in the in 1910 that uh, uh, under the right conditions, UV light uh, in aqueous solution can lead to fixation of CO2. This is the basis of, uh, of the organic soup theory of Oprin and Haldane. So that was known. So Haldane's theory goes, uh, on the early earth, there was no life. Okay, <laughs> Haldane's, Haldane's assay is actually quite interesting. It starts out, it's just 10 pages long. It starts out by saying life always arises from uh, prior life, as we learned from Pasteur, with one exception, and that's at the origin of life. And there it arose from rocks and water on the early earth. So how was that possible? So he spends the first page, five pages uh, saying that um, that's the that's the case, and then he also uh, infers that virus were an intermediate in the in the life process, which is very interesting because nobody knew what virus particles were in in, in 1928. <clears throat> And um, uh, so there was, but so that you could, you it was known that UV light would uh, would be able to fix CO two, or uh, to act uh, convert it into uh, reduced carbon compounds in the presence of water. But today we know that no, there are no cells known that live from uh, ultraviolet light. Okay, ultraviolet light is something that you use to sterilize environments. It's not something that you use to to grow life, and that's because it's much too energetic. Um, it burns our skin, and, and in the same way, it damages the nucleic acids of uh, of, uh, of of cells. So, uh, UV light is uh, much too harsh a source of chemical energy. It's more destructive than it is constructive. Today, we know from from physiology, hydrogen and CO two, by contrast. Um, have the wonderful ability to form all by themselves the basic building blocks of the backbone of microbial physiology in cells that live from H2 and CO2. That is, you, H2 and CO2, if you put them together with the right catalysts in a reactor overnight, will convert to large amounts of uh, formate, formic acid, which is the first intermediate in the acetyl-CoA pathway. Uh, they will further react to acetate, which is also the second free intermediate in the acetyl-CoA pathway. And they will furthermore react to pyruvate, which is the most central compound in carbon and energy metabolism in all cells. This happens overnight at 100 degrees uh, at mild pressures and uh, in aqueous solution, but you have to have a catalyst. Okay, so what's the catalyst? Well, you can use iron nickel. There's a, a, a mineral that is made in hydrothermal vents called aworuite. Its formula is nickel three iron. The formula could not be simpler. It's just a metal alloy. There's also magnetite, that's iron three, oxygen four, Fe3O4. That is a, a mineral that is formed during the process that generates hydrogen, serpentinization process. Uh, that will also serve as a catalyst for that process. And you can also use iron sulfur minerals, although they won't, they've not been shown yet to produce pyruvate, which is the key step because that's the, the C3 compound from which all amino acids and uh, and ultimately the bases are derived. So the, 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 circumstance, the circumstance that you can um, react these two gases overnight in a, a base in a, in a test tube in the presence of a suitable catalyst and then the backbone of microbial physiology unfolds all by itself in the presence of naturally occurring minerals that are formed in hydrothermal vents in, indicates to me a very strong form of homology between the processes uh, going on at uh, serpentinizing hydrothermal vents and, uh, the, my, and the physiology of primitive cells that today live from hydrogen and CO2. The warm little pond theory does not have anything vaguely similar to offer. Furthermore, the RNA world does not have anything vaguely similar to offer. Also, those who suggest that viruses, life arose from viruses. Well, viruses arise from metabolism today. 
And so if you propose that life arose from viruses, you have to say what kind of metabolism was driving their uh, ability to replicate because viruses are basically just parasites. They live off of the metabolism of uh, free living cells. So saying that viruses uh, came first doesn't help in terms of the overall uh, energetics of the process. You have to have an energy releasing process that drives the synthesis of all of that. And that's what uh, that's what's so nice about this H2CO2 reaction. It does uh, release energy and that's why it goes forward all by itself spontaneously, both in cells and uh, in the laboratory. Let's uh, clarify this a little bit. So um, we know that despite all the life forms that we, uh, or the major life forms which are present at this point of time, they, that they use oxygen for, uh, as, as like to, for the respiration to produce energy and other uh, biomolecules. We know that the oxygen was not present to, to this, this amount at the, at the early stages of life. So, which is like beyond 2 billion years. Um, and at that time, uh, we know that the carbon dioxide and, of course, hydrogen hydrogen is always there, but carbon dioxide levels were higher. And as uh, Mike Russell says, that you can't understand uh, origin of life if you don't consider the uh, earth conditions or environment conditions. So con considering that, we have few examples, the two examples that you gave, methanogens and acetogens, that they use not oxygen, but they fix carbon dioxide or carbon in a way, either, either methane or uh, carbon dioxide to produce the same biomolecules. And of course, then there are there is a lot of biochemistry and, uh, and stuff, which uh, we can leave it for now. But the central point is that we are looking for uh, some sort of um, uh, prebiotic chemistry, which will fix hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So in these methanogens and acetogens, it's done by... Uh, enzymes, but we need a catalyst to fix this hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And your idea is that it's the these hydrothermal vents, uh, the specific process which you men mentioned is uh, serpentinization, which does that, right? Well, ser serpentinization makes the hydrogen, okay? Then the, the reaction of hydrogen with CO2, uh, that's a secondary process. And that you, you said you need catalysts, but the catalysts could not be simpler. They're just metals, right? Just pieces of metal. See this, this thing here, this is a piece of metal, right? And that will catalyze the synthesis of uh, the backbone of life if you put it uh, anaerobically in, the, in, the, uh, in that reactor overnight. So it couldn't, it actually, the, 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 the basic chemistry of life could not be simpler. Yes, oxygen comes much later. That's a product of, um, of photosynthesis, aerobic, uh, oxygenic photosynthesis about 2.7 billion years ago. And um, so the question is, where did the CO2 come from? So we know where the, we know where the hydrogen comes from. The hydrogen comes from the um, reaction of water with rocks uh, in the crust, uh, iron two containing rocks that leads to the oxidation of the iron two and the water is reduced to hydrogen and that comes up as hydrogen gas. And it has done so since there was water on earth. Okay, this, the process, furthermore, you can't stop it because it's, uh, it's uh, exergonic. It releases energy itself. Okay, you don't have to add any energy for this to take place. In fact, you can take metallic iron and react it under anaerobic conditions and uh, with water and it will, it'll make hydrogen to this day. Um, where did the CO2 come from? Well, different people have different views on that, but I think if you ask earth scientists and go into the literature, you'll see that there was one event that was of overarching significance for the, uh, for the origin of both the earth as we know it and uh, CO2 in the atmosphere to get this initial reaction started. Do you know which event I'm talking about? No, can you please explain? The moon forming impact. Okay, shortly after, so in the beginning we had, the earth was formed by accretion, all this, these pieces of rock and stuff from the planetary disk accreted around the earth. And we had this, this ball of rock that may or may not have been molten all right. If it was molten, it was not completely molten. 
Uh, it may have had the basically the uh, the situation that we have on Mars, where there was a little bit of a, a molten core, but the mantle was not fully molten or didn't stay that way. Then there was this impact of this Mars-sized planet uh, called Theia, uh, and it didn't hit straight on. It hit at an angle that gives our Earth its 23-degree tilt, <laughs> and also means that the moon is displaced five degrees relative to the solar plane. And uh, we know that that melted the Earth entirely because the Earth and the moon are made of the same material. Furthermore, there's no crater, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it didn't leave a crater, there's no crater. That means the Earth was completely molten. And what that did is that converted all of the carbon from the original accretion process to CO2, okay? You can do the experiment. Take a sugar cube or uh, a piece of wood or any other form of carbon that you can find and throw it in a volcano and see what happens to it. It will come out as carbon dioxide gas. And that has nothing to do with molecular oxygen in the atmosphere. It has to do with the, the reactions of carbon with um, and oxygen with magma at uh, 1,200 degrees up to uh, 2,500, the, the magma has about 1,200 degrees uh, Celsius, and the estimates are that the early Earth, the magma ocean, initially had up to uh, 2,500 degrees. For several hundreds of years, the Earth was surrounded by vaporized rock, if you can imagine, okay, <laughs> that's how hot it was. <laughs> rock vapor is really hot. It wasn't even just magma, it was just, it was vaporized rock. So what that did is that by melting the planet that converted all the carbon, carbon that comes to earth from meteorites, for example. Um, people say, yeah, well, life came from meteorites. Well, the carbon in meteorites is, is mainly in the form of what are called polyaromatic hydrocarbons, PAH. Uh, they're similar to graphite in pencils, okay? It's completely inert. It doesn't, it doesn't react. Uh, you, there are microbes that can live from polyaromatic hydrocarbons, but they require molecular oxygen and very good enzymes in order to break it down, okay? Polyaromatic hydrocarbons are inert. Given uh, under anaerobic conditions, they will not react, and that's why they stay stable for hundreds of millions of years. However, if you react them uh, on a molten planet with uh, 2,500 degrees magma, then they are converted into CO2. Now, what could be better than that? CO2, okay, you may, have you ever heard of um, the carbon cycle? Yes. Okay, do you know that uh, on the, in the ocean and on land, all primary production starts from CO2. Yeah. All life processes start from CO2. That's also the, the case at the, at the bottom of the ocean at these hydrothermal vents. Carbon dioxide is the purest possible starting material for the origin of life. Okay? So the moon forming impact converted all of the carbon into CO2 and furthermore put it in the atmosphere so that it could start, um, um, okay, after the moon forming impact, the, all of the water and all the CO2 went to the atmosphere. Uh, within a very short period of time, the, uh, uh, the atmosphere, the water in the atmosphere, the atmosphere cooled, it, it, it rained out, the oceans were maybe five to 10 kilometers deep, probably deeper than today's, much deeper because there's an extra, at least one volume of ocean volume of water trapped today in the crust and the mantle. And that was at that time in the oceans, uh, the uh, CO2 dissolved in that was brought down into these convective systems where hydrothermal vents are formed. That's how water seeping down into cracks in the crust as the early crust was forming and then being warmed by uh, more contact with the, uh, the what's it called, the, the thermal gradient, the further you go, further down you go in the Earth's crust, the hotter it gets. So today it's about what, 25 degrees per kilometer, roughly. And um, so that water dragged carbon dioxide down and that carbon dioxide at the same time could interface with the hydrogen that was being formed from the serpentinization process, the same reaction where water was interacting with the crust so water and CO2 meet together 
and uh, can release energy to form reduced carbon compounds that are the backbone of uh, microbial metabolism. So the moon, the moon forming impact is usually not considered um, in an origin of life context, but if you work in the uh, in the area of, if you're uh, inclined to adhere to autotrophic origins theories, that is that all life starts from CO2 today, it also always started from CO2. The You need a pure, rich source of purified starting material, and that is that gaseous CO2. And that is exactly what the moon forming impact delivered. The other interesting thing that I like about hydrothermal vents and uh, you know the, the chemistry which is giving origin to uh, different biomolecules is the is the fact that okay I mean hydrogen and carbon dioxide of course they uh, they come together and they form compounds but they are not so easy to um, kind of react right I mean hydrogen which uh, has an issue with the solubility and stuff. Um, so, but all those things can be uh, somehow overcome because of the conditions itself that uh, just because hydrothermal vents, they are like below, uh, like quite uh, um, like at the, at the sea base. Um, so it has high pressure, which will increase the solubility of hydrogen gas. Uh, one no, example, no, or... the, um, I need to, to do my seminar. The, the hydrogen gas is being produced within the earth. It's not coming from the atmosphere. It is coming, it is being produced in the crust. The hydrogen is being produced in the crust. The CO2 is highly soluble, right, in water. And it's being drawn down uh, into the cracks in the crust uh, by convective currents. <clears throat> so H2 and CO2 do not meet in the atmosphere. They meet at the site where hydrogen is being produced by these uh, hydrothermal vents. And they are, um, you can also, I mean, we've done this experiment. You can put H2 and CO2 in a glass bottle and heat it up to 100 degrees or 200 degrees and let it sit there for months and nothing will happen. Nothing at all will happen. You have to put catalysts in, okay? If you put the, the uh, iron nickel, the Auruide catalyst that comes, that is this iron nickel alloy is made, synthesized in hydrothermal vents, still is today. That's where it was discovered in a, on the South Island of New Zealand in a place called Awarua. That's why it has such a horrible, <laughs> horribly complicated name, Awaruite. Um, uh, so H2 and CO2 are gases. They are both very inert. They will not react readily. But if you put them in the presence of transition metals, they will react. And this is because transition metals like iron, nickel, cobalt, uh, 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 molybdenum, and tungsten, they have D electrons. Okay, D electrons are, okay, if we, if we imagine that an atom is this big, a carbon atom is maybe this big, an iron atom is maybe this big, and these D electrons have very complicated shapes. They're, they're orbitals, okay, that have very complicated geometry and they can hybridize and form hybrid orbitals with carbon and nitrogen so that carbon and nitrogen atoms can react such that uh, the, 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 the carbon binds to the, to the metals and then becomes bent and then it can react to undergo reduction to formate or acetate or pyruvate. And, um, and then it leaves the metal uh, by a, uh, some lysis process, either uh, using um, water hydrolysis or using sulfides as thiolysis. It comes off the metal, but the metal remains unchanged. Okay, and so the electrons are not coming from the metal in this process. They are coming from molecular hydrogen. Molecular hydrogen does the same thing. It melts onto these transition metals. Molecular hydrogen has two hydrogen atoms, and then when they contact metal, they come apart into two hydrogen atoms with one proton and one electron bouncing around on these, on these uh, surfaces. If you go to my website, there's a nice origin of life movie that shows that process going on, www.molivol.de. Go to the movies, and there's, there's a movie on origin of life and another movie on origin of eukaryotes. They're both about five-minute movies. And then you can see these processes going on. And um, 
uh, also in terms of the chemical synthesis and why that is conducive to um, the, the origin of life process. All right, so furthermore, these, these compounds are being synthesized uh, in situ uh, and they can be concentrated around their site of synthesis because of the naturally forming compartments that are generated by the hydrothermal process. And these are compartments that uh, uh, have been known since the very first hydrothermal vents were discovered in the 19, uh, the submarine hydrothermal vents in the early 1970s. Of course, surface hydrothermal vents have been known forever. Um, uh, they're as old as, uh, as human, human experience. Um, it's the submarine hydrothermal vents that were the, the, the novel discovery. And they're the ones that harbor this, this, these new forms of life that nobody ever saw before. And they really provoked uh, a, an image that is much more similar to life emerging near the gates of hell than uh, emerging in, from the heavens above. So basically, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and the the catalysts they can uh, do the job or give this basic components which uh, we need at least like or, or the, the the kind of components or molecules that we see even in the present life forms um, like C two or C three uh, molecules like pyruvate and and stuff right yes uh, which are which are then um, again can be used uh, to to uh, get amino acids or bases and um, they're the, they're the starting and, point they're the starting point of metabolism yes yeah so then how do we get compartmentalization from from this process okay so what do you mean compartment do you mean biological compartmentalization cells so uh, so one thing is that, of course, in um, in hydrothermal vents, you mentioned that there are little compartments which can act as compartment compartments uh, for these reactions. The other thing is the the actual compartmentalization, the kind of compartmentalization that we see in the in let's say bacteria or archaea, for example. Well, we just skipped over the origin of the genetic code, and that's actually <laughs> so you need. Okay, um, in order to get to Fully fledged, fully fledged free living cells. You have to have ribosomes. You have to have a genetic code. You have to have protein synthesis, program protein synthesis. There are a lot of steps. So what we, what I've just described now, are the starting points, right? So we have clear cut homology between the um, energy releasing reaction that takes place today naturally in hydrothermal vents. Exactly the same reaction takes place. Um, in the laboratory and gives rise to exactly the backbone of carbon and energy metabolism in prokaryotes. So that's the point where I say this theory has very clear homology. Okay, there's a very clear homology between um, a geochemical process and a biochemical process. Now, some people will say, oh, well, there was maybe methane oxidation. Methane oxidation will not cut the mustard for a number of reasons. If you have oxidants in order that are strong enough to break down methane, then they're also going to uh, break down any of the compounds that uh, you would need in order to get to amino acids, cofactors, bases, a genetic code, et cetera, et cetera. So we've only got uh, so much time uh, that we can uh, discuss here. So number one, the origin of the genetic code is not solved, but uh, this is one of these uh, long-standing unsolved problems, but we say that maybe it has been solved in principle. So let's let's take a look. How does evolution work? Evolution always starts from something simpler and gets more and works from the simple to the complex. Well, what are the components of the genetic code? It's basically it's basically the um, the tRNA that interacts with some RNA. And uh, with codons and then amino acids uh, attached to the other end, there's the ribosome that holds the RNA and the tRNA in place so that they can uh, read the RNA message. Then there's also um, actually the most important player, and that's the amino acyl tRNA synthetases, which some people believe have nothing to do with origin of the code. Other people like Charlie Carter and uh, Richard Wolfenden believe are the key to understanding the origin of the genetic code. 
So for each of these three components, the tRNA, the ribosome, and the amino acid, ACL tRNA synthetases, there are much simpler starting materials that will do the job. Paul Schimmel and his colleagues showed in the 1990s <clears throat> that highly reduced little hairpins of five to seven uh, nucleotides can, <clears throat> um, can be recognized by amino acyl tRNA synthetases as, um, as a tRNA substrate. And you can get proper, uh, very non-random, rather specific. What Paul, what Paul Schimmel showed is that uh, using these very small, he called them mini helices, seven nucleotides, five to seven nucleotides, that uh, look like the stem of a tRNA, those would be charged properly by amino acyl tRNA synthetases with the right amino acid, uh, not exactly as specific as the full tRNA, but with a great deal of specificity. And what he discovered from that is that much of the information, about half of the information that is required um, to specify a tRNA, um, a tRNA amino acid interactions is not in the anticodon, it's in the stem, okay? So that little stem, that little molecule is a basic unit of function. And it's only uh, about 10% as long as the, uh, as, the, as the real molecule. So you start with something simpler. That, that is a starting point for the tRNA. Um, Ada Yonat uh, in, in Israel has shown, with, uh, she got the Nobel Prize for the ribosome structure. Uh, she showed that you can take um, from the, you know, almost 4,000 nucleotides in the, in the, uh, of RN, rRNA in the ribosome, you can condense uh, the function down to a structure that is about 70 nucleotides long, and it contains the peptidyl transferase site. That is the site that actually makes the peptide bond between two adjacent uh, amino acyl tRNAs. And um, that, fun that core structure has a certain specificity. Uh, it has activity. It also has activity with many helices, and she calls that the proto-ribosome, okay? So, it's much smaller, okay? It's about 1%, roughly 1% the size of the, of the full molecule, and it has the basic element of function. So if you start with a simple function like that, that can add some specificity to the uh, protein forming uh, process, then you're on your way to generating the, the basic function from which the uh, genetic code arose. But then what, where, where does the genetic code actually arise? It arises, um, not from RNA uh, amino acid interactions, it arises at a class of enzymes called amino acyl tRNA synthetases, because those are the enzymes that attach the right amino acid to the right tRNA. And there's, uh, so what Charlie Carter uh, has shown uh, in, in his work is that you can also take like, 30%, you can, you can prune off about 70% of amino acyl tRNA synthetase function and get down to a core. There are two kinds. There's class one and class two amino acyl tRNA synthetase. It works for both. You can get down to a core structure that performs the basic, uh, the basic function of attaching the right tRNA, uh, the, the right amino acid to the right tRNA. And uh, the much of the information required there is localized in the stem, so that these these he calls them the oozyme or the protozyme uh, the uh, for uh, an ancestral form of enzyme. That kind of protein is an excellent candidate for the very first protein altogether because it encodes the information or it contains the information that specifies the code, because everything else depends upon that. Everything else depends upon that. And what the, 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 the two, the class one and class two amino acyl tRNA synthetases that do the two, each do 10, roughly 10 amino acids, they have the curious property that they are complementary, as if they were complementary strands of a single hairpin. And very few enzymes in nature are related by that, uh, by that process. 
And so this might be a clue as to the, the nature of the very first genes. So there are clues as to how the uh, um, genetic code might have arisen. And there are people who have worked on that. There are, other, there are prizes out, uh, some guys uh, announced a $10 million prize yeah. to yeah. Yeah, recapitulate the genetic code. But if you look at it, and if, if Schimmel and, Yo and Yonat and Wolfenden and Carter are right, then we basically already have the solution there and we don't need to look further. Um, that, that's possible. It could be that we're already looking at it. So the, uh, another, a, pre, a possible precursor to the genetic code, this has been discussed since Lippmann, Lippmann days, uh, in the in the early 1960s, uh, is a process called non-ribosomal uh, protein synthesis, peptide synthesis. These are uh, similar to polyketide synthases. These are a class of enzymes that synthesize peptides using the information contained with the pep within a peptide. They make antibiotics that are and they contain very often contain D and L amino acids, um, but the the sequence of the um, small peptides that are generated by these systems is specific, but it's specified in the active site of the enzyme itself, the active sites. And so this is a way in which um, structural information can bootstrap information to into more complicated, into more complex processes. And uh, this can also lead to uh, things called autocatalytic cycles. Ah, what's interesting is that uh, well, there's several things that are interesting. Uh, the origins process is probably best understood as the evolution of catalysts, right? You start out with simple inorganic catalysts in the solid phase, followed by simple inorganic catalysts in the liquid phase, followed by very simple uh, organic molecules with cat catalytic activities. Um, uh, Matthias List got a, uh, uh, oh, Matthias is not his first name, List, uh, Benjamin List, sorry. <clears throat> Benjamin List got a Nobel Prize for this last year in chemistry. It's called organocatalysis. Simple amino acids um, have catalytic abilities. And so that might be the next stage, then moving on to more complex uh, catalysts like organic cofactors, then small peptides, and then encoded peptides. If, if we look at the the organization, molecular organization of cells, the um, underlying the back the the bottom line is that the the in the in the evolution of life, the catalysts became more complicated, and more specific, and instructed. So you started out with instruction that was based in the structure of simple minerals, right? That gave rise to simple products. And these products, if they have catalytic activity, then they can lead to the next level of organization. And this, if, if that feeds back into the original, uh, in, in any way feeds back into the, uh, into the preceding reaction, then structures called autocatalytic networks or autocatalytic cycles can emerge. There are very few examples, <clears throat> known examples uh, in prebiotic chemistry of autocatalytic cycles. They're mostly theoretical constructs, but you can identify them in the, in the metabolism of modern cells. Um, a very uh, talented mathematician in New Zealand, Mike Steele, has worked on this problem for many years together with Stuart Kaufman, who um, has been promoting the idea of autocatalytic cycles since the 1980s as an alternative to the RNA world, thinking about peptides as, as precursors to, to uh, the, the first catalyst rather than replication. Ah, there's something interesting to say there. Um, so these autocatalytic cycles uh, would help in terms of um, getting greater feedback of material into uh, a higher complexity. At some point, selection sets in and at some point, you have to have a repository of information. Now, one of the <clears throat> tenets of the uh, one of the tenets of the RNA world has always been replication. 
replication, replication. How do you, how can you have evolution without replication? And so this, this idea basically stems from work in Manfred Eigen's and Saul Spiegelman's labs in the early 1960s. They were doing experiments with something called, uh, an enzyme called Q-beta replicase, which is a viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase that and it starts with a small RNA template, makes plus and minus strands spontaneously if provided with ribonucleotide, ribonucleoside triphosphates, it will just make RNA in a test tube. And of course, what these experiments always show is that the, the RNA molecule that comes out is always the one that is fastest replicated, right? Right, yeah. no, what, no, 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 there's no other outcome. And this gave rise to the idea, but it also makes variants because the replication is not specific. This case gave rise to the idea of replication and selection and evolution among molecules. Uh, replication selection among molecules and evolution among molecules before there were cells. Okay, this is the core of the RNA world hypothesis that RNA was somehow synthesized from these precursors. It could evolve, it could uh, mutate, it could replicate, and this organized material, all right? So the problem is, is that let's go, I, I've, I've made a list here of all the replicating RNA molecules in prokaryotic cells. Let's take a look. Okay, that's the complete list. <laughs> there are no RNA replicating cells, replicating RNA molecules in prokaryotic cells. There's an occasional RNA virus in eukaryotic cells. RNA in prokaryotes, the precursors of eukaryotes, eukaryotes are more derived. What, what does RNA do? It, it, it promotes, it's, it's, a, it's a structural component for making proteins. Right, the cell is 20% RNA, and it's 50 to 60% protein, and the only role of the RNA is to make that protein. Okay, it does not replicate at all. It does not serve as a template for replication. It um, it makes enzymes that replicate DNA. Okay, and it makes enzymes that do the rest of the work uh, within the cell. It probably has always been that way. In other words, the, the idea of a, uh, an RNA world where you had replicating molecules uh, from which uh, some functions were selected is attractive, but it does not connect to the chemistry of cells in any way, okay? And so if you're interested in physiology and trying to draw, draw um, inferences between um, geochemical processes or simple chemical processes in the physiology of cells, there's no place at all for an RNA world. My view is that, and this is also uh, contained in a small paper I did with uh, John Barris. Uh, there's, this view is contained in a small paper I did with John Barris uh, in which we developed the concept of a ribofilm. And that is that you had synthesis at something like a ribosome, uh, something like a hydrothermal vent, okay? And these, this synthesis could have formed small or increasingly large polymers that were not replicating. They were just sitting there unfolding catalytic activity, just like enzymes and RNAs do today. And these catalytic activities could in some way steer the products in a particular direction, because if you have a catalytic activity, then, it, then you start to get very non-random sets of products. And this is where autocatalytic cycles set in, because you, you add structure to the, to the process. And it's simply the nature of the catalysts that changes over time. And so, so this, this concept of ribofilm is just sort of like a layer of gunk that is not similar to a PCR reaction. That is the exponential growth of, a, of, of RNA in a, in a Manfred Eigen-like experiment. It's much more like the transition from a dead cell to a live cell, okay? 
So a cell that has all the catalytic surfaces in, in place, and then slowly the, the, the process given the right substrates come along and then the reaction can get started. That's, uh, it's a different way of looking at the process, not exponential growth, but slow growth and organization. What do you think um, when it comes to metabolism in a way, what is happening at the hydrothermal vents? So whether we'll have information again as an RNA or it'll be something like DNA, for example that we can get directly this kind of autocatalytic cycle uh, where the catalysts can form a template which would look like DNA and then uh, it can get translated either by uh, proteins directly, uh, one example that you gave, or it has to be again DNA, RNA and protein kind of transition. Um, well, let's start with protein to RNA to DNA if you want, if you want to draw a line. Okay, so RNA is, uh, is good for performing the, the, the work of making proteins, but it is not good for long-term uh, information storage because it's just too labile. DNA is excellent for that. And uh, so uh, a very promiscuous, a, a very widespread class of proteins are called um, reverse transcriptase. This is what basically what allowed the gene technology revolution to take place, cDNA synthesis, copy DNA from, from mRNA. And these uh, reverse transcriptases take uh, are small proteins that take RNA as a template and they use DNA monomers as the um, substrate and they synthesize a single strand of DNA from the single strand of RNA and then they can make a loop and turn back and synthesize the second strand of that DNA and make basically make a double-stranded DNA molecule out of a single-stranded RNA template. Now, where do DNA precursors come from in metabolism? They come from RNA, and it's a it's a uh, it's always a radical-based mechanism. Okay, there are three kinds of ribonucleotide reductases. One enzyme does all four, uh, uh, converts all four RNA bases into their DNA counterparts always using a radical mechanism to extract uh, um, uh, hydride from the, or extract a, a hydroxyl from the uh, uh, RNA ring and replace it with a, uh, a hydrogen atom. It's always an, a, a, radicals or single electron reactions, a very primitive kind of chemistry that's uh, germane to all organisms that use ferrodoxin as their main energy carrier, which is all anaerobes. So, the uh, the primitive nature of ribonucleotide reduction is not surprising. So if you have um, uh, uh, small proteins, peptides, or functions, there are also inorganic analogs that will make uh, DNA homologs out of uh, out of RNA precursors. But it's it's a it's a non enzymatic catalyst. Then in principle, you could get to um, so small DNA repositories of information, stable, okay? You have to have a memory because if you're, if you're starting to evolve functions, this all assumes that you've, you've solved part, at least part of the translation problem that you can extract information from these nucleic acids and, and turn it into reproducible function. Maybe not 100% reproducible, but uh, highly non-random, okay? And if, if that's the case, then the, the, the DNA molecules become repositories and um, provide a, a template for multiple rounds of RNA synthesis using the same kind of polymerase activity, but then not with, uh, with DNA as, uh, as, the, as the monomers using RNA as the monomers instead. This process today always requires um, always requires enzymes, and it probably was never any other way. So if you were to ask me about a, a sequence, it would not, uh, it's, it's sort of like RNA gives rise to protein and DNA, but if you look at the biosynthetic uh, provenance of the two, RNA always gives rise to DNA, but amino acids always give rise to RNA because the bases themselves are derived from amino acid biosynthesis, amino acid precursors. 
So basically, it's um, uh, like a complex version of uh, something like organocatalyst uh, ca catalysis that you mentioned, right? Mm, yeah, it's it's um, well, it's this is information. OK, yeah. uh, so catalysis is one thing. Information is something else. And what information does is it specifies catalysts. Right? It helps you make better catalysts. And once you've solved, once you once you're able to remember information with the help of DNA, right? RNA is not very good at remembering information because particularly under the alkaline conditions of hydrothermal vents, it's going to be highly, highly labile. Right. So uh, the, the the DNA synthesis provides a memory from which uh, information can be extracted to make better catalysts. And that promotes the transition from, let's say. We start again. We'll go through the the series. Solid state inorganic catalysts, minerals. Many there are many examples of catalytic minerals. Then soluble inorganic catalysts. Those would be metal ions in the main: uh, calcium, magnesium, iron, nickel, cobalt, uh, uh, molybdenum. Then. Uh, small organic cofactors, organocatalysis, amino acids. The next level would be cofactors, right? Which are more specific in their catalytic activity. And then the next level would be embedding those cofactors within a uh, an organic phase that adds uh, specificity to the to the reaction. And there you start with maybe not initially coded proteins, but non-coded proteins, or something similar to non-ribosomal protein synthesis, that you get a, a, a molecular environment where the um, uh, cofactor can have more specific interactions with, uh, with its surroundings and with its substrate, and eventually um, encoded uh, also ribosomal protein synthesis and encoded functions. So and then you're done. These are the properties which basically this huge enzymes they bring. I mean, for example, ferredoxins, we can replace them with the uh, this uh, metal uh, surfaces. But the, dif the difference is that uh, ferredoxins, they have more specificity and uh, kind of better regulation in the, in the function uh, well, than these metal surfaces. Uh, the ferredoxins are one electron at a time, and the metal surfaces are dependent upon hydrogen, whereas the... Uh, the the uh, ferredoxins are basically uh, soluble electrons. There's a difference between a hydrogen atom and uh, and an electron, right? Yeah. Um, the the uh, the nickels with hydrogen are very good at two electron reactions, and uh, iron atoms are very good at, at one electron uh, reactions, as we see in ferredoxins. So so your question initially is uh, was how do we get to compartmentalized cells? Well. Once you get it, first you have to solve the problem of the origin of the genetic code and the origin of protein synthesis. And once you get there, and then also small DNA molecules that can encode enough information to provide something like a protoenzyme and a thousand different ones of those, basically the, the, the set of functions that you need in order to make a free living cell. Today, it's about 1200, 1500 genes for an autotroph. Right, something that can live from H2 and CO2 and fix nitrogen, although it's likely that the, uh, the first environments provided ammonium rather than, uh, uh, than abs an absolute requirement for nitrogen fixation <clears throat> in the last universal common ancestor. Then <clears throat> once you've solved those problems, uh, you can start to solve the problem of putting enough uh, genes and enzymes in one place so that you can make the transition to the free living state. And there we get into uh, chemiosmotic theory and the fact that the serpentinizing hydrothermal vents are alkaline on the inside. Uh, the ancient ocean is about pH 6.5. Uh, it's slightly acid on the outside. There are natural pH gradients at these at the vent ocean interface so that protons could in principle fuel uh, an ATP synthase um, to sub, to replace substrate level phosphorylation as a source of uh, of energy. Once that's done, then all you have to do is discover a, a means to replace that ion gradient with some sort of pumping mechanism, 
which occurred independently in the common ancestor of acetogens and methanogens. In the acetogens, it was probably a protein called RNF, which is um, stands for rhodobacter nitrogen fixation. It's a simple pumping protein that takes electrons from ferredoxin, transfers them to NAD. In that process, it pumps electrons, uh, it pumps protons or sodium ions from inside the cell to the outside. This gradient can be harnessed by the ATP synthase in methanogens. The, uh, the pumping proton is a, is a uh, methyl transferase. The, the pumping protein is a methyl transferase that uh, transfers um, a methyl group from a nitrogen atom in a terran to a cobalt atom in, no, no, to a, uh, uh, to a sulfur atom in, um, in, uh, in coenzyme M. And uh, that methyl transferase reaction is not really a redox reaction, but it releases enough energy to also allow uh, this protein to pump. And that independent solution in the methanogens allowed them to uh, pump uh, protons or, or sodium ions so that they could harness energy. And once you've solved all those problems, so your carbon energy metabolism, nitrogen fixation, amino acid, cofactor biosynthesis, uh, protein synthesis, genes to remember what you're doing, and energy harnessing mechanisms that are driven by the H2CO2 couple in addition to cell wall biosynthesis and lipid biosynthesis, then you can worry about escaping as free living cells. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, I wanted to do compartmentalization bit um, uh, first because uh, it is conceived conceived in as in like easier than, of course, the the information bit, which is much much. It's, uh, it's the last step. The compartmentalization is is worthless if you don't have the information contained. Yeah, I mean that's definitely, and it's always difficult, at least for me, to think of a link between um, information and the, uh, the the compartmentalization itself. They're because they're independent. Okay, they're independent process. The 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 um, so it's uh, also my inference of Luca is that it had the genetic code. This is so the genetic code is much more highly conserved than the chemistry with which uh, cells are compartmental from the from the environment. Right, the the lipids in the archaea and the bacteria are fundamentally different. Isoprene ethers in the archaea and fatty acid esters in the in the bacteria. Also, the chemistry of the cell walls is fundamentally different. The peptidoglycan based cell wall in the uh, in the bacteria and the S layer uh, based cell wall in the archaea, those are independent. They're not conserved from a common ancestor, although there are some links between peptidoglycan synthesis and uh, pseudomurine synthesis in uh, some of the, the primitive archaea. So that something like a, there, there might even be a, a common ancestor of the cell wall, but the lipids are clearly uh, independently arisen. And that's because the transition to the self-compartmentalized state arise twice, arose twice uh, in the origin of life. And that's also a, a key tenant of my my version of this theory. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that. So you you mean you're now talking about something like Lubka, the uh, last bacterial common ancestor, and uh, Lika, that they uh, last archaeal common ancestor, and they kind of come together or well that's that would be the origin of eukaryotes. No, yeah. no, the in 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 my theory, the uh, the common ancestor of bacteria and the common ancestor of archaea emerge independently from the same hydrothermal vent. Okay, that's interesting. That's and, and... that's the the basic the basic tenant. I'd have to go. I mean, I could get a picture and show it to you, but this this is uh, so that actually compartmentation from the environment, right? The the escape, the process of escape is the very last process in my version of of origins right you start with all of these all of these other processes right you solve all those other problems that can take place within inorganic compartments well no problem it, it's fine okay and the, the compartments don't need to divide they just need to be growing territories so that you can you can um 
uh, increase your molecular complexity within that uh, growing territory, that growing set of territories. But the, uh, the, the, the final transition to the free living state is independent. And that's why the archaea and the bacteria are fundamentally different from one another. Also in there, they're, they differ in many things. The, the ribosomal structures, right? They differ in at least 30 proteins, indicating a very early divergence. The ATP synthases are related, but uh, fundamentally different in their overall structure. And um, the, 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 uh, the lipids are fundamentally different. And so what that indicates is that, and also the stereochemistry of glycerol phosphate, that one did not arise from the other, but that they arose independently. For any other, if you took the, the wings of insects and birds, you would not try to derive one from the other. You would say these are obviously independently arisen processes. And uh, in comparative physiology, looking at the two pathways, their, their least common denominator of lipid biosynthesis in archaean bacteria is uh, acetyl-CoA, which does not have a chiral compound in the active moiety of the molecule, All right? Melanyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA. There's no, no carbon, chiral carbon there. Okay, so yes, um, uh, the last uh, bacterial common ancestor and the last archaeal common ancestor, they had some commonalities, right? That shared, are shared with LUCA, but they also had some differences that uh, distinguish them. So, um... And why don't we think about, for example, uh, phenomena like coacervates or phase separation uh, when we think of compartmentalization? Do we really have to have compartments to reach uh, something like at the stage of LUCA, for example? Oh, uh, you're talking about uh, liquid, liquid uh, phase separation? Phase separation, yes. Do you know any forms of life that are organized like that? Uh, no. I mean, are there any the, forms of life that are organized like that? The, the thing is then this, of course, they, it's, it's, it, it's irrelevant. Okay. It's a, it's a phase separation process it's like vinegar and oil, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you have the, uh, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting and it's an organizing principle that can give you local concentration differences of, of um, miscible substrates, a little bit like lipid rafts when, uh, or, uh, um, <clears throat> um cholesterol or or sphingolipids right they form little regions of uh within within membranes but that's not how cells are organized cells are organized with about 10,000 ribosomes on the inside they have a, a lipid membrane and a cell wall turgor resistant cell wall they have hpases uh in that uh lipid membrane uh, that uh, synthesize atp they have proteins in that membrane that generate ion gradients. And um, so that's where we have to get. And uh, so liquid liquid phase separation um, does not fulfill those requirements. So it's interesting, but it doesn't help us get to cells. But thinking about some sort of a protocell, don't you think like it will be much simpler? I mean, that's why we are calling it a protocell. Um, and it may be, I mean, of course, it's- it Tanner, that was, a, that was a suggestive question. Say, don't you think? And the answer is no. <laughs> Read my papers, then you'll yeah. see what I think. And I think that the inorganic compartments serve as the compartmentalizing mechanism because they are there. They are just a natural, um, a natural component of the environment. Remember, we started the Norm Little Pond. The environment yeah. Im imposes- uh, effects that direct the 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 both the nature of the theory and the the nature of the products that emerge, and if we start in in pores of hydrothermal vents, rocks, then you have your natural compartments existing, and they serve as a natural concentrating mechanism uh, to get the compounds uh, at sufficient concentrations to reach higher complexity. And we don't need coacervates or anything in free solution. Those are concepts that are germane to much thinking on this topic. Okay, back to back to Stanley Miller and, and back to um, Oprah and Haldane, but they're, they're, they're not required in the hydrothermal vent hypothesis because we have inorganic compartments that are naturally formed and furthermore contain the catalytic activity that is required to make the uh, organic reaction go forward. So don't I think? Yeah. 
think that it would be simpler? No, it's actually much more complicated. And, at, and on the bottom line, it won't work. You get So you make a free living cytosol, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then you have to put that into something. No, that free living cytosol is not going to stick together. Okay, because you're not in... Because the, these these phase phase this liquid liquid phase separation that takes place within cells, right? Within cells, within the cytosol, where you have 500 micrograms, uh, so 500 uh, um, grams per liter protein concentration, right? 500 grams per liter protein concentration. That's where these kinds of processes take place, not in free solution. If you take 500 grams per liter solution and then put it in the ocean, it will diffuse and you'll never see it again. You have to have some synthetic process generating that high concentration. And uh, that's one of the things that these micro compartments at hydrothermal vents can do, okay? My, uh, compartmentation concentration. So, no, 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 no. That's not, uh, protocells are um, uh, micropores in uh, inorganic, inorganic pores in 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 rocks uh, filled with very lifelike organic content it's a fundamentally different way of looking at the problem if you get used to it it everything works a lot better that's why that theory is in textbooks go ahead yeah. microbiology microbiology textbooks yeah so uh, i mean we started with the uh, where where you mentioned that uh, you you can't or you don't understand why origin of life question or origin of something is important for humans or humanity um so one of course aspect is the historical aspect etc but as an engineer and a biochemist i think that it's probably you know creating life in the lab uh, which can be one step uh, further in in the progress of humanity so what do you think about uh, synthetic life in the in the lab? Uh, can we create it? Or maybe that's where we are going even with the with the all uh, research on origin of life work? No, because even if you um, the, the, that's a that's a technological question. It's a technological challenge. It's not an intellectual question because the question of origin of life is how did we arise? Okay, how did our ancestors arise? And even if you had a reaction where you put chemicals in on one side, had a reactor, you put chemicals in on one side, now comes E. coli with the wrong genetic code on the other. You still can't prove that our ancestors arose that way. You would just have some narrative that would make it more plausible. The actual answer to the origin of life is irretrievable. Okay, we will never know with certainty what happened regardless of what we can generate in the laboratory. And so synthetic uh, synthetic life as a as a concept is immaterial to me. It's not interesting because it's not it's not natural sciences. The natural the, the question of natural sciences is how did we arise? This is what humanity wants to know, not what can we do in the laboratory with high tech. What what uh, what humans want to know is where do we come from? And that's a very different question. It's a different question, but I think that that will be the next step because I mean. Um, okay, well, that's that, but I, I don't. So you asked me what do I think. I don't think it's important. Okay. I, it might be the next, you never know what's going to be the next step, right? We know nobody knew that COVID was coming. Nobody knew that we could sequence uh, genomes. So that might, that might come someday. What's more likely uh, than synthesizing new life uh, is just modifying it uh, beyond recognition. People have already uh, found ways to modify the genetic code in a, in a number of ways, and uh, and that that one might come back to bite us in uh, in ways that we cannot anticipate now. But can we create artificial life in the lab? Well, this is the fourth time you've asked the question, and <laughs> you know better than I do. And can we do it? When, uh, can you think of any, um, any technological challenge that humans have found impossible? The, I mean, yeah, there are some, but... Um, Such as splitting the atom? Is time Nuclear travel, fusion? for example. I mean, what? That's time travel, for example, but... Uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> but uh, there, there is, there is tunneling. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
So there, there are things that, well, that's, there are things that are physically impossible. For example, you know, negating gravity, that's pretty unlikely. Uh, but this is a, but those are, those are theoretical challenges, right? That require you know, different laws of physics, uh, making, creating life, and we already went through this. If you make, if you make it, th if you take the contents of an E. coli cell, right, and take it apart, can organic chemists synthesize those components? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. If you can synthesize B12, which E. coli doesn't need, okay, you can you can synthesize the components of of a, of a E. coli cell, and then maybe some of the iron sulfur clusters won't be so nice to begin with, but you can get it going. Right? You can synthesize, you can synthesize a, a mycobacterium genome. You can synthesize an E. coli genome. That it can, in principle, be synthesized. You take all those components, put it into something, and as the very last step, what do you do? Is the very last step, you put a compartment, a compartment. Tape, you put a compartment around it as the very last step, right? Or you try to inject it into a compartment. <laughs> no, you, first you make your you make your soup, right? You make your cell, your cytosol, and then you try to compartmentalize that in some sort of little droplet machine. Yeah. Why should that be impossible? But why should we want to do it? Just to prove that we can do it? That's very self-centered. <laughs> well, no, not only that, we can kind of use it later, right? Uh, if we want to, I mean, th there are, for example, the, the 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 whole problem with the climate change and stuff. If we understand it well, uh, yeah, and we can do yeah, it in a controlled way, we can use. Don't it. you don't you think it would be better to modify existing life than to create fundamentally new one? It, it is. It is. It's. Okay, it's. I think so, both ways. It's just that probably I don't know one which one is more feasible than the other. It's, so I don't know. I don't know why you keep asking this question. It's not. It's not an interesting question for me. It's. It's yeah, an interesting question for you, but not. It's not an interesting question for I, me. Yeah. Yeah. That I completely get it. Um, what do you think? Uh, so using the the same information about the hydrothermal vents and stuff, can we find or can we get an idea about life on uh, other planets, on exoplanets? Obviously, it's yes. So if we have yes. the similar systems, I mean, yes, of course, then we understand that okay, yes, there'll be uh, yes the targets on the. You can name the examples. Would you like to name the examples, or do you want me to name them? Uh, I know some of them. Like uh, even even for example, Venus has has these kind of uh, vent structures. Uh, no, nah, but it doesn't have water. Too hot. The temperature is the problem. Um, yeah, temperature is like, wrong. Um, uh, Enceladus yeah. is a moon of Saturn. It has uh, it's spewing water out into space, and that water contains hydrogen. There's probably something similar to serpentinization going on, but the the carbon in Enceladus is uh, probably just fragmented uh, the, in the plumes of Enceladus, fragmented uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons uh, because Enceladus was never liquid. It was never molten, right? And so that carbon never got converted into CO2 so that it could react. And this is, again, the importance of the moon forming impact. So yes, there's, there's every reason to assume that exactly the same process is going on. If we can do this in my laboratory, <clears throat> yeah, making um, making the the back the the most important the most central compound in metabolism, pyruvate, from gases in water using one metal as a catalyst overnight, and we get it in 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 um, in uh, physiological concentrations, then that's that for me is the the main problem. Okay, so other people are going to say, yeah, well, you need UV light in order to make the bases, and that means you have to be in the habitable zone. But uh, this theory, in this theory, this expands the habitable zone uh, considerably because it expands it to moons uh, that just have to have uh, chemical energy in, in the form of water and, uh, and native metals, reduced metals. Great. So, um, in your words, as as you generally say, that life is a chemical reaction. Yes. So let's let's uh, stop at that. Uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation, sharing your fascinating work, um, and it's been a uh, great to have you. Thank you. Okay, it's my pleasure. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.